This will be the last video in my series on the metaphysics of Berserk. I already covered the deepest material when I discussed causality, alchemy, the occult, and Judaism. Though, do not misunderstand, it is vital to understand the manga's references to Hinduism and Norse mythology. Only then can you get a full appreciation for the effort that went into Berserk's sophisticated world-building. I will start off with how the manga references Hinduism, and then I will get into some of the cool creative liberties that Kantaro Miura took with Hindu mythology. Liberties that demonstrate his sophisticated knowledge of the religion. Unlike Berserk's references to alchemy and the occult, which were either mistranslated or barely acknowledged, virtually all of the references to Hinduism are clear. Almost all of them are directly ripped from both real-life events and actual concepts within the mythology. Take the Kushan Empire, for example. There was an actual Kushan Empire that came to prominence back in the first century AD, comprising what we know today as Afghanistan, Pakistan, and northern India. The most famous ruler of the empire was Kanishka, a name that is, of course, very similar to the leader of Berserk's Kushan Empire, Ganishka. Unlike the Kushan Empire in Berserk, which was almost exclusively Hinduist, the real-life Kushan Empire was famous for syncretizing Hinduism with other religions of the time. For instance, the founder of the real-life empire, Kujula Kadphysis, integrated several elements from Greek culture into his new empire. It integrated characters from the Greek alphabet into their pre-existing Karoshti script, and even minted their coinage using Greek deities. There were elements of Zoroastrianism that were introduced under Ganishka's reign, namely the equation of a pre-existing solar god with the Zoroastrian Ahura Mazda. Most importantly was the introduction of Buddhism. Though there is a lot of crossover between Hinduist and Buddhist concepts that we recognize today, the union of these two religions was particularly novel back at the beginning of the Common Era. The syncretism of Hinduism and Buddhism was so popular and strong at this time that it was largely responsible for bringing Buddhism to Central Asia and especially China. The real-life Kushan Empire was unbelievably progressive and tolerant for its time, at least in regards to religious matters. This is a stark contrast to the totalitarian, murderous nature of Berserk's Kushan Empire. I wouldn't put this down to Kentaro Miura's misunderstanding of history or anything. He does, after all, manage to beautifully weave Hinduist religious concepts into the story. Take the names Ganishka and Kanishka. I have two theories regarding why the initials in their names differ. The first theory is that it is a simple mistranslation, but the second theory gives that initial change greater meaning. Even if it wasn't an intentional change, the change works magnificently on a symbolic level. I'll explain. As we know, in the manga, a large part of the Kushan army is comprised of magic beasts, known as the Pashaka Gana. Pashaka and Gana are two separate things in Hindu mythology. Pashaka, in both Berserk and Hindu slash Buddhist mythology, are flesh-eating demons. The two most prominent and powerful examples of Pashaka in the manga are the Kundalini and the Makara. The Hindu Makara is a half-terrestrial and half-aquatic sea monster. The front half of the Makara usually takes the form of a crocodile, a deer, or elephant, while the back half is usually that of a fish. A half-elephant, half-fish creature is the form that the Makara takes in the manga. The Kundalini takes the form of a serpent in both manga and mythology, but its purpose in mythology is more symbolic than literal. In Hinduism, the Kundalini serpent symbolizes the inner enlightenment that occurs during Tantric Yoga. It takes the form of a divine energy that starts at the base of one's spine and then coils up the spine like a serpent until it reaches the crown of the head. This is where the seventh and final chakra sits. Once the divine energy reaches that seventh chakra, the meditator will reach spiritual enlightenment. It's interesting to note that this enlightenment is achieved through the correct channeling of one's breath during meditation. 
In Hinduism, the life-giving breath that binds and penetrates all of the universe is referred to as prana, a word that also appears in the manga, in chapter 270. In that chapter, Daiba describes either the suit that Guts is wearing or the protective energy surrounding him as the prana of Durga, Durga's divine breath. I will get to who Durga is in a second. As for the word Gana, it has a dual meaning. It can refer to a simple assembly of people who share the same interest, or it can refer to a specific assembly of people who serve the Hindu god Shiva. The Gana that served Shiva were led by Shiva's son, Ganesha. The name Ganesha leads into my theory regarding the change of initials. I like to think that because Ganeshka is both Shiva and the leader of the Vishaka Gana, that his name was a symbolic reflection of that. If you combine the real-world leader of the Gana, Ganesha, with the famous ruler of the Kushan Empire, Kanishka, you get Ganishka. Again, I admit, this could very easily be a coincidence, and the initial change was a translation error, but you cannot deny how well this works symbolically. Let's move on to some of the other Hindu terms. Daiba, a prodigious sorcerer and one of Ganeshka's advisors, refers to Guts and Serpico as Kshatriyas. In Hinduism, a Kshatriya is defined as two things. One, a warrior, and two, the second highest level in Hinduism's four-level caste system, known as the Four Varnas. This is interesting because even though Guts and Serpico are warriors, you wouldn't think that Daiba and Ganeshka would lump them in with their culture's nobility, which is what the Kshatriyas are. You also wouldn't expect them to be helped in battle by the Kushan gods, which is what Daiba seems to think was happening in Chapter 272 of the manga. In that chapter, Daiba refers to Guts as a Kshatriya of Durga, and Serpico as a Kshatriya of Vayu. Durga, in Hinduism, is the goddess of strength, destruction, and wars. This is an appropriate designation for Guts for obvious reasons. Vayu is the Hindu god of wind, which is appropriate given Serpico's ability to use wind in battle via the sylph sword and cloak. I suppose this implies that the Kushan gods are impartial in who they help, but this is never fully confirmed. These are all the references to Hinduism from the manga that I was able to elucidate. There are, unfortunately, two terms that I was unable to fully define. One is the name Dhaka, given to the demonic element of the Kushan army. The only thing from Hinduism that I could find that resembles the term Dhaka was Dukkha, which translates to suffering, obviously a very important concept in both Hinduism and Buddhism. Given the way the Dhaka are birthed, equating them with suffering seems appropriate. That said, suffering is such a broad concept within Hinduism that I'm reluctant to make a definitive link. Finally, there is the term Viravadana, which Ganeshka uses to describe guts. If there is a Hindu in my audience that could point me towards what this term means, please let me know in the comment section below. I look forward to highlighting your comment for everybody to see. Now, most people might anticipate a discussion of Norse influence on Berserk to be rather barren compared to the discussion we just had on Hinduism. The only obvious reference to Norse mythology seems to be Griffith's Tree, which springs up at the end of Chapter 306. This is an obvious reference to the Norse world tree, named Yggdrasil. This is confirmed by a quote at the very beginning of the following chapter. The same quote, also equates this tree with the body tree from Buddhism, the one that Buddha sat under when he achieved enlightenment. Though it doesn't use the word body, the word sutra points to Buddhism, and the most significant tree in Buddhism was the body tree as far as I know. Unfortunately, when it comes to Norse mythology, most people only know about the very basic concepts like the world tree and maybe the names of a few gods. Due to this, they would be unable to pick up on the numerous other references littered throughout the manga. Take the title of the manga. The word Berserk is derived from Viking warriors that were labeled Berserkers. These warriors were often designated by the bear pelts or wolf pelts that they wore on the battlefield. 
This is very interesting because some of the berserkers, particularly those known as the Old Hednar, would act like they were possessed by wolf spirits while on the battlefield. Of course, this is relevant to the manga because Guts comes under the influence of the Beast of Darkness when he wears the Berserker armor and succumbs to its magical effects. That beast takes the form of a wolf. Finally, there's one other reference to Norse mythology that has been staring us in the face for most of the manga, and we never even realized it. Hell, I didn't realize it until I did my research for this video. The thing I refer to is Od. The way Od is described in the manga is very similar in function to the aforementioned Hindu prana. It is a life force that binds and penetrates all of the universe. By manipulating Odd, one can cast magic. The concept of Odd is, oddly enough, that wasn't a pun by the way, based in a pseudoscientific theory made up by a man named Karl Reichenbach, an 18th century industrialist, chemist, and philosopher. He tried to legitimize the metaphysical concept of the life force by giving a scientific basis to it. He conceived of an omnipresent force that was allied to electricity, magnetism, and heat. Reichenbach proposed that this force could actually be seen, that it could take the form of colorful auras that surround us. This, however, would require you to be a highly sensitive person who spends hours upon hours in the dark, of course. Anyways. Reichenbach named this force the Odic Force, and he named it after the Norse god Odin, the Allfather. I do not know why this was shortened to Od, especially when Mira has demonstrated a willingness to rip concepts with the exact same name from other religious traditions. Some might say this is because Od doesn't equate to Odic Force, but given the manga's references to Norse mythology and the similarity in function between Od and Odic Force, I would be shocked if they weren't the same thing. I can't really think of a fancy transition from that into my conclusion. I don't know. Maybe it's because I don't like the idea of not talking about Berserk's metaphysical influences anymore. As a lot of you know, I investigate religious influences for many forms of media, and some of the most fun I've ever had doing that was in regards to Berserk. So, for that to end, it just sucks. Maybe what I'm feeling right now is approaching how some longtime Berserk fans felt when they learned of Kentaro Miura's passing. Miura really did something special with Berserk. Not only bringing all of these metaphysical concepts into a perfect harmony, but making us curious as to what their origins are. In this way, he made millions of readers curious about what makes other cultures awesome. Though there are numerous forms of media that contrast cultures, and sometimes blend them together to create new mythologies, Berserk is unique in that it blended such a large number of influences, while simultaneously giving credit to the real-life concepts they are based on, and working them into a new mythology. In this way, I think Miura accomplished through fiction what one of his biggest influences, Carl Jung, did through nonfiction. He pointed to metaphysical concepts that were common across all cultures and brought them together. Just as Jung's work is being referenced over half a century later, I have no doubt that Miura's will bear the same fate, and thank God for that. Berserk is an incomparable work of art, and I, like many of you, will be forever grateful for it. Now speaking of works of art, here I actually have a transition, I'd like to talk to all of you about the sponsor of today's video, Masterworks.io. Look, we've been hearing about a lot of uncertainty in the market lately. Inflation is a word that seems to be a part of every news broadcast. Because of this, you want a place where you can invest your money and protect its value. One asset you might not have considered is contemporary art. And of course, because it's supposed to be an asset that only the extremely wealthy can afford. Well, not anymore. Masterworks.io gives you the ability to invest in artworks from the likes of Banksy, Monet, Basquiat, and Picasso for only a fraction of the price that the billionaires pay. If you're worried about the viability of this market, consider the fact that between 1995 and 2020, contemporary art prices have outperformed the S&P 500 by 164%. 
Plus, Deloitte puts the current market worth for contemporary art at about $1.7 trillion, and expects that price to go up another trillion over the next five years. If that sounds promising to you like it does for me, head over to their website by clicking on the link in the description box below. It's very easy to sign up and get started. Just create an account, start browsing paintings, and start investing. Once again, that's masterworks.io. Thank you very much for sponsoring this video.